was in high school, and I just knew that I was being called to the church. But I didn't know specifically what that would look like. I really loved my youth group. I had a lot of fun with my youth group when I was growing up. And I thought maybe, because I love youth ministry so much, maybe I'm being called into youth ministry. And I pursued a degree in youth ministry. That's what I studied. And it was while I was in college that I continued this struggle for God to call me. What does it look like? What does it look like for me to be in the church? Then while I was in college, I went to an event much like this called Exploration, which is a national event. And I think that tomorrow we'll hear more details about Exploration. But I went to the Exploration event. And while I was there, I sat in some different workshops. And while I was sitting in this workshop on what it means to be an ordained elder, a pastor in the United Methodist Church, I just sat there thinking, this is totally me. And it wasn't any kind of verbal confirmation. I didn't hear anything. I didn't get the much longed for letter from God in the mail that said, Dear Kathleen, this is how I'm No, you're going to be a pastor. It's going to be great. It was one of those where it just felt like I had peace in my heart, but I was also really excited. That's how it was for me. For you, you might feel that differently. It might be because enough people have said to you, this is something you really ought to consider. You do this well. And there's that outward confirmation that then we might feel inwardly. We might have that sensation inside ourselves and nobody around us is saying anything, but we might know in our heart of hearts that this is how God is speaking to us. That's God speaking to us too. Now, one thing that, um, that Bishop Middleton has often said when she's been with us at this event is that um, when she approaches discernment and knowing if this is God calling, that um, the prayer maybe we want to pray is, God, if this is your will for me, increase my desire. If this is not your will for me, decrease my desire. And maybe that's one of the ways that we can sort out if it's really something that I want or something that God wants. Now, if it's something that God wants, that doesn't mean that we won't want it too. Does that make sense? So if God is calling us, and it's something that we're really excited about doing, because I think that was one of the questions. How, how do I know if this is God calling me, if I really like it too, or if I'm really interested in this? God wants us to be happy, and God wants us to have passion about what we do and how it is that we're called. And so just because we enjoy it, doesn't mean it isn't God. <coughs> Even better right? Even better if we're able to love what we're doing, because this is how God is working in our lives. And so this is one of those things. How do we know that it's God? How do we know that it's God calling me? Why is God calling me? We don't always know in a formula that this is the same for everybody. The one thing that we can all share with confidence is that God calls each of us. How we hear that, how we discern that, and what that looks like, that varies. But the one way that we can really sort that out is to make sure that we're asking God what God wants to do with us so that we can respond. Does that clear that up a little bit? When the bishop called me into her office uh, two and a half years ago and asked uh, me about being district superintendent, uh, my first response was no. And her word to me was, I want you to go home and I want you to do that prayer uh, of, if this is God's desire, increase my desire for it, decrease my love for what I'm doing. So I went home, it was Thanksgiving weekend, and I wrestled for a night about that. And the more I prayed, what happened was, it really decreased my excitement or even thought about being a district superintendent. And I thought of all the things I didn't want to give up in what I was doing as the director of Connectional Ministries. So that was my first prayer. So I went to bed and thought, okay, God, I heard your voice. But in the middle of the night, and I don't usually wake up in the middle of the night, but in the middle of the night I woke up, and I went downstairs and began to pray that again. And over the next several days, as I prayed that prayer, the things that I was just so excited about in my old job began to think, oh gosh, 
I don't want to do that. And the things that I said I would never want to do as a superintendent, I began to get excited about. And I'm thinking, whoa, what is this? So I put it on the shelf. And I waited a couple more days. So God's call is going to come. We just have to get our mind and our heart with God. And that's not just one prayer. And then it gets, it's clear. It might be. Maybe you have a better prayer life than I do. That it's going to be crystal clear all of a sudden. But I think we need to keep working at that. There was another question that fits with that. And there are two questions really is, what is the best way to hear God's voice? And how should I gain spiritual trust in God? Pat Wolliver is a pastor uh, in the New Cumberland District. She is also a spiritual director for many pastors and people. And so we've asked her to respond to that. Um, it, it was, I also was a district superintendent, and it's wonderful that you had days. <laughs> uh, I had one night, and uh, basically said, okay, and uh, so how should I gain spiritual trust in God? Um, you just do it. Uh, whatever it is that God is asking you to do, and it may come through another person, in this case it came through a bishop, um, you take the step. The only way to do it is to do it. Uh, when scripture talks about trust or believing, it's the word is believing into. So I can say that I believe this chair will hold me up. I, I really believe that. It's a wonderful chair. And I can tell you everything about the chair. But unless I sit in it, I will never fully live that out. I won't trust it. So if God is asking you to do something, you simply at some point, yield your will, surrender your will to his, and you act on it. You may not know where it's going to take you. You may not know um, all the particulars. You may not know who's going with you. You may not know a lot of things. But the only way to build your trust is to act on it. Now, having said that, I also recognize that this question can come from someone who is... Uh, could be in a dysfunctional family or could have been abused or, uh, in, or molested as a child, it is very difficult for those people to trust a higher figure. If that's true, um, then whoever wrote the question, or if any of you had that question, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, he only gave me two minutes. So um, you take three. <laughs> it, it, it is a matter of, um, of getting some healing about that and then learning to trust that God does indeed love you. Um, but if you came from a background where you were not loved or strings were attached, it's very difficult to then trust God. So if that's where it came from, I appreciate that. And it's not as easy as just sitting in the chair. Um, the other question is, what's the best way to hear God's voice? Um, <laughs> and I wrote my answer. He gave me these, and I put, listen. <laughs> that's like a simplistic answer. But um, do you remember Bruce Almighty? And he's asking for a sign. And there are like signs everywhere. And he's like not getting it. Just, he's just not getting it. Well, sometimes that's true for us because we really aren't listening. We're chattering at God. You got monkey mind going. And you're just chattering and chattering and chattering and you have to stop long enough to listen. You need to listen. Most of us understand prayer as talking at God. Prayer is really listening <coughs> to God. And you listen by paying attention. Now, that sounds really simple, but do you know how hard it is to pay attention? You are, you are trying to pay attention to God, and now your mind's on your exam. You're trying to pay attention to God, and your mind's on some relationship. You're trying to pay attention to God, and somebody's yammering at you. It's learning to listen and pay attention. And listening whether you hear something or not. It's showing up and putting yourself in front of God and then listening. And I guarantee you that if you keep it up, he shows up. Um, you had given me one other one, and that is how can I grow in my faith when I feel like I'm in a rut? Um, my response to that is if you're in a rut, go serve someone. Go serve someone. 
Uh, and, and one of the things uh, I said um, after that is go serve one. That is, go serve someone you're not comfortable with. Go serve someone that's your enemy. Go serve, because in the serving, God is present. And in the serving, God will reveal stuff to you about you. And in the serving, you will receive. The best way to keep yourself out of the rut is to be in the business of serving others. There, there is a line out of an old, old hymn. I mean, even older than I am. Prone to wander, Lord, I leave. feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. It feels as though when we're in a rut that God has left us, but often, it, but God never leaves us. We are the ones that journey, and we need to come back, and as Pat said, through serving. Uh, these are great questions, and I would like to, I mean, they're not questions that pertain just to you all. They're questions that pertain to all of us. They're questions that pertain to me, uh, questions that I wrestle with on a daily basis, because I think that's really a question of, who does God call us to be? And that doesn't end when we're in youth group or college or anything. That's an ongoing, everyday, daily basis. And this actual question has been on my mind a lot lately because we're actually, we just started a sermon series in our church called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. And really, it really is framed around this very issue of how do we, in this day and age and culture, share the love of Jesus Christ and introduce people to Jesus Christ in a way that will catch them, or be relevant to them, or be meaningful to them. One of the things that has happened in our culture is, it, for, for whatever reason, for a lot of us in the church, it's gotten way too easy to talk at people about what they should do. And as soon as we start talking at people about what they should do, in other words, just looking at them and, and starting to ask questions like, do you know Jesus? And if you don't, you need to. While that's great, or maybe our intent behind that is good, we start to make people feel like targets more than loved people. So I think it begins with having a heart for people and where they're at. That if somebody doesn't know Jesus, is our primary motivation behind that a, a target for us to notch sort of on our belt kind of thing? Like, we have conquered them and I've earned stripes before God kind of thing? Or is it out of a driven, just hurt for them that there's a part of their life it could be so much richer, actually all of their life could be so much richer if they knew this transformative love that has changed me. And I think depending on which way we begin to approach it and having that kind of mindset, then the opportunities begin to present themselves. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more from Tim tomorrow morning, but Tim has been serving as, a, as an intern with us over this past year. And in many ways, Tim to me is the kind of person that exemplifies kind of this bridge. Because let me also say this, there's, I think a lot of times we have false dichotomy in our minds, which is in the world people have to come into the church and surround themselves with church people and therefore leave the world, or get completely in the world and ignore the church completely. It seems like those are only our only two options, and yet all the time in the Gospels we see Jesus remaining true to who Jesus is, but he's hardly ever isolated and secluded in the temple. Where do you find Jesus? He's at a well talking to a woman who's just had five, you know, or deaths in her family, and and all these people are in multiple husbands and all these kinds of things. You hear stories about Jesus talking about a father and two sons, and one of them takes everything and leaves. It's stuff that's real life and occurring outside the temple, and yet Jesus never compromises who he is. Jesus meets a woman caught in the very act of adultery and somehow walks the fine line of not compromising his standards and integrity, go and sin no more, and yet addressing her as a real person, meeting her in her hurts, that she feels loved and accepted. So how do we do that? And Tim, to me, has modeled that in a lot of ways. One of the things that Tim did for us earlier in the year is he literally walked our neighborhood, just walked. Just walked out and walked. He, he didn't wear a sign saying, do you know Jesus? He didn't walk up to somebody and hand them a card saying, do you know Jesus? He didn't hand out a tract of any kind. He walked the neighborhood with eyes of love. And he ended up meeting a gentleman on his front porch, and they just struck up a conversation. And Tim's first question to him when they started talking wasn't, do you know Jesus? But this gentleman very quickly saw something different in Tim and started asking questions about why he was there. And then through those questions, opportunities availed themselves for Tim to say, oh, you know, I'm here actually from my church, and we care about this neighborhood, and we care about you, and you know, is there anything we can do to serve you? Why would you ask a question like that? That's crazy. Nobody does that. Well, I follow Jesus, and Jesus says that serving is important. And go from there. 
And so somehow for us, I don't know if there is a good formulaic answer. I think it's questions of intentionality. Do we ever just look around us and pray, God, show me who I can serve this day, who may be someone who doesn't know you. And also, can we do it with a sense of integrity? Because in our world, there's so much darkness that if the light of Christ lives within you, people will see that light and then we'll be drawn to it. Especially, I think, people in this age range, we, we face such issues of insecurity and wanting to be accepted <coughs> and wanting to find purpose. Who has the best answers on that? Christ. So I think when we ask those questions in terms of the, the drugs and, and the other things, we find a way to meet people where they're at so that they don't feel judged, and yet we don't succumb to the darkness they are in. We allow the light of Christ to be brought to them and hopefully be intentional and full of integrity to bring them to a new place and to see something different within us. Because I can promise you this. In a world where most of the people with their groups of friends continue to stab each other in the back and gossip about each other and try to one-up each other, when they find somebody that has the security and the peace and the purpose and the love to not do that, whether they ever express it or not, you can better believe that they want what you have. And then they come and they ask and they share. But I don't think that happens without hearts of intentionality and service and humility. So that's kind of a roundabout answer. Did I get both questions there, Tom? Um, and it, I guess I'll just end by saying, I think it's amazing when we offer a simple prayer of, Lord, I'm hurting for so and so. Would you open a door to share your love with them and really just see what God does from there? So those are just some thoughts on it. In the Lewisburg district, uh, we've had done a thing this uh, summer and fall called Come Home for Christmas where we've done a, a whole lot of stuff about getting folk to invite their friends to come home. We had signs made up, yard signs that says, come home for Christmas. And uh, we invited people to take them and put them in their yards. Well, one of our pastors had an extra sign. And so she was riding, and there was what she thought was uh, nobody's land. And because there wasn't the house around or anything. So she went and she put the sign there. Before she could leave, this woman came up and started cursing her out and said, I am so tired of people putting signs in my yard. And so the pastor said, I am really sorry. I'll just take it. I didn't know. And she said, I had all these political signs. What political sign is that? And the pastor said, well, it, we're doing a, inviting people for Christmas. That set her off. She said, I'm an atheist. I don't want that in my yard. And so Sue apologized. She went home. Till she got back to the church, the woman had called and left an angry message. The next day, when Sue went to the office, there was another message from this woman. Went off again. So Sue took it to their prayer group and said, boy, you know, I've apologized. Let's pray about it. So after they prayed about it, one of the women said, I think what we need to do is bake her some bread and take it and simply apologize. And so they did. And then one of the women said, I just said, wouldn't you like to come? We're having a women's tea. We'd really like you to come. And the woman said, I, I will never come to church. Well, till they got back to the church, the woman had called and thanked them for the bread. So Sue thought, what do I have to lose? So she went back. They took another loaf of bread and said, we just want to, again, apologize. And, you know, if you would like a ride, we'd be happy to take you. Now, I'm going to quote. The woman said, I don't ever go to church, but what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so they went and picked her up. They took her to this women's tea. And her comment was, I never knew there were so many nice women in church. It is meeting them where they are, apologizing. Now, has that woman been back? I don't know. But has it begun to thaw? We hope so. All right, there was another, a couple of questions about seminary. If I go to seminary, what, what undergraduate degree do I need? Do I need a GR, a, what, what is the GPA that you need to get into seminary? So Anna Jordan is on staff at Wesley, uh, seminary, so she's going to answer those. 
All right, so before I answer those questions from the lens of Wesley, I want to be clear, there are 12 other United Methodist seminaries that are all fantastic, and there are hundreds of other seminaries that, are, that belong to other denominations that are also fantastic, and you really need to find the place that's right for you. Granted, I think Wesley's fantastic, that's why I go to work every day, but, you know, please find the place that's right for you. So, I have three questions. What major? Um, I can tell you that we have every major under the sun. Um, agriculture, pre-law, calculus, I mean, you name it. So, that has really no bearing. Um, if you do think that you want to go into seminary, though, I would tend you towards the philosophy, religion sort of departments, because you're going to have a great grounding coming in. But, you know, if you like psychology, do psychology, by all means. Um, GPA. At Wesley, we look for a 3.0 or better. Of course, you know, the higher your GPA, the better you can get on your merit scholarships and those sorts of things. Um, but we're looking for a 3.0, basically. Uh, the GRE. What is the GRE? Well, for those of you um, who are just into the SAT, the GRE is the SAT of graduate school. Um, the graduate record exam, as they call it. We don't require that at Wesley. Uh, I'm not certain about what the other schools do, but we some people send it to us and we look at it, but we certainly don't require it. So. Boston does. Sorry? Uh, the Sacred School of Theology of Boston is only around 13 that requires it. Okay. If you didn't hear Michelle, uh, Boston is the only one of the 13 United Methodist schools that does require the GRE. Perfect, thanks. All right. Two other questions, and we're, we're at our time. One was about being a chaplain in the armed services. Do we have pastors who are chaplains? Yes, we do. In our conference, they ask, you ask, someone asked how many. I don't know how many, but if you'll see me afterwards, there is one of the, the pastors in our district that is serving as a chaplain, and I can give you his name, um, and you could contact him. Also, the Board of Higher Education and Ministry in Nashville, uh, we can give you their contact information. There is a department that can help you uh, if that's what you're considering. The last question is, do I want to take the safe route or should I jump? Now, I'm assuming that means, do I just play it safe or do I feel God calling me and I should say yes? I'm going to conclude with a story. There's a man, if you've ever been on Highway 1 in the West Coast, it's a phenomenal ride. It, it's very twisting and turning, but it, you can look out over the ocean. And so there's a guy who's on his cycle, and he's going, and it's a gorgeous day, and he's looking, and the more he's looking, the faster he goes. He misses a turn and flies off. His motorcycle goes in one direction, and he begins this free fall down to the ocean ragged rocks at the end and he's trying to hold on there's nothing but there is a tree growing sideways if you ever seen it, that really does happen and he grabbed it and he's hanging there and he looks up and he can't climb up and he looks down and if he lets go he's going to be smashed on the rocks so he begins to yell help help is anyone there and there's a voice and he says I'm here. And the man said, who is that? And the voice says, it is God. He said, oh God, you've got to help me. And God said, well, do you love me? And he said, well, you know I love you. And he said, do you really love me? He said, you know I love you. I go to church every week. I tithe. I work with the youth. You know I love you. And then God said, then if you love me, let go. Well, the man looks up and he looks down. And he said, oh God, it's too far. He said, if you love me and trust me, let go. The man looks up and he looks down and he takes a deep breath. And then he says, help, help, is there anyone else there? <laughs> there comes a point when God says, do you love me and do you trust me? If so, let go. And if you let go, God's arms will enfold you. God's arms will surround you. And God will walk with you. 
And so the question, do I take the safe route or do I just jump? I think if we're really called of God, if we really profess to know Jesus Christ, then we jump and we let go. <clears throat> And God will be there to guide us. Any questions that you have, you've seen the adults who are here, but there are others. Please feel free to ask questions individually.